something that uh, we started to do a few years ago. We as a physicist, uh, from time to time, need to go to data, or if you don't have the data, uh, do the experiment and test the theory. Uh, and then um, I started to do evolutionary game theory inspired by biology at some point in 2005, 2006. But this turned into something that was also uh, an indication or a way to model human behavior. And when we deal with human, um, there are a lot of things that you have to take into account. And normally, uh, theory is one thing and experience is another thing. So this talk will be more or less about my journey into one specific problem that it's uh, human cooperation. And it's one specific aspect of human behavior. So cooperation, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, can be seen at all level of biological organization, from the cell to small animals to uh, lion hunting uh, big um, uh, prey, etc. And, and then in human society, that actually cooperation is behind our ultra uh, modern society, as we were able to get agreements and develop a society that is. Uh, very far from what it was uh, in, in our, I don't know, 2,000 years ago. Uh, very far in the sense that I don't know if it's better than 2,000 years ago, but at least it's more than uh, 2,000 years ago. So that's the problem. This is an evolutionary puzzle. I, I actually, Darwin himself, when he wrote the, the origin of the species, recognized that his theory could not explain uh, the origin and, and emergence and, and sustain of cooperation among the different, uh, different species. The key idea was that um, his theory cannot account for facts like, for example, uh, a species that sacrifice uh, at the cost with, uh, for example, to um, help other species like human, for example, when you help somebody else that is not related to you. There is no any kind of team relationship and therefore that could not be explained by uh, Adam selective advantage, let's say, for natural selection, that you, what you do normally in gene selection, for example, is to help your relative, so you can propagate your pool of genes from one generation to the other. But this, uh, let's say, non-gene um, cooperation cannot be explained by the Darwin theory, and since that, more than 150 years ago, it has remained a evolutionary puzzle. One way to um, study this is with uh, game theory, and in particular, I will focus on the problem of cooperation and coordination among humans. And so, this is just a few questions that we would like to be able to answer. For example, how cooperation emerges in the both in humans? Uh, what are the mechanisms that promote cooperative behavior? Uh, how does our behavior change when we interact with other individuals and with our environment? And whether we can build or not realistic models. Uh, of how individuals behave and use them to study uh, other problems that have to do with societal or organizational uh, dynamics. So uh, normally this is done uh, theoretically using game theory, this is a branch of applied mathematics, uh, in which you study um, strategic interactions between two or more individuals. Um, I will focus, there are a lot of different games or different situations that you can model using this, but I will focus uh, on these four because they can be expressed as two by two games with a payoff matrix. Uh, there are two actions available for the players. And depending on the ordering of these entries of the payoff matrix that I will explain later, uh, you have different games. Harmony, which is, uh, a, let's say, favors cooperation. And then the most famous one is the prisoner's dilemma, which is uh, the one in which cooperation, the survival of cooperation is more difficult. This is uh, the game that if you are able to explain why cooperation survive using this kind of games, then it should be no problem to explain also all the kind of ordering of this pair of matters. Then you can study Nash equilibrium and so on and so forth. A lot of, of different things that uh, game theorists and uh, mathematicians do, but um, and we, we have done a few things about that also, but I would like to focus more on the experimental aspect and, and try to find uh, mechanisms that promote cooperation. So let's explain a little bit more, the, for example, the prisoner dilemma that is the, the hardest for, for cooperation. So essentially, you have a pair of matrices 
in which you have two players, and depending on your action, and also the action of your opponent, you get a payoff. Um, and the ordering is, is this one, where T is here, R, uh, punishment, and, and what is called the surface payoff. So if you are, for example, a player that you are a cooperator, and you are playing with another cooperator, both of you get this example three. If you are a cooperator and your opponent is a defector, then the defector gets five, and you, and you get zero. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, if you are a defector and, and your opponent is a cooperator, then you get five, and, and the cooperator gets zero. The other way around, here, this is symmetric, and then if both are a defector, both get one. So as you see, whatever your opponent does, the best for you from an individual point of view is to play as defector. Because if you play as defector with a cooperator, you will earn five, and if you play with uh, another defector, you will earn one. That is more than if you play cooperator with a defector, because you, in this case, earn zero. But if both were cooperator, the total amount, the total wealth of, for both players would be um, higher than uh, unilateral defection. That's, that's the problem here. That's where the dilemma is. What is best for you from an individual point of view, and what is best for, the, for both of you, for a collective, um, let's say, for, for a collective uh, game. So this is the, the dilemma, um, and the evolutionary game dynamics um, is, is the theory that describes how population of these individuals evolve. So once you, you, are, you pick an action, and the other one pick another action, then you, you uh, so at some point you say, okay, I, if, if the game is repeated, you say, okay, I earned this, maybe I have to change my strategy because I want to maximize my payoff, or I don't want to be the suckers anymore, so I would like to evolve my uh, strategy. And this is where evolutionary game dynamics enters into, into the game, because then you have a lot of, well, this is uh, the snow drift, our example, which, uh, if both cooperate, both can meet first here and first here, but if there is no cooperation, no of these uh, can meet. So uh, when you are going to evolve the, the, the population of agents, of the factor of cooperators, you can use a lot of different strategies uh, to evolve this. This is a moral process that is usually uh, done for in biological systems. Essentially, you take um, randomly, well, not randomly, it's proportional to your payoff, someone that you replace with uh, different strategies, uh, imitate the best, you look at your neighborhood or at the whole system and see what is the one that has the largest payoff, and then you imitate the strategy of that player. Uh, this is replicator dynamics, that is one that uh, we use a lot. Essentially, is uh, depending on uh, how far you are from the average um, payoff on the population, so it depends on the in your payoff and the average in the population. Uh, this Fermi-like rule is just allowed for irrational move. It's something that is proportional to the difference between payoff. I will explain it a little bit more. And a few more. So you have a lot of these evolutionary uh, rules, because in this case, what evolves is the population of individual, not the strategy itself. So for example, one, once, one, exa uh, one case in which you will be interested is uh, very, for example, as, as, you, as you do when you do disease uh, spreading, is you have a population of fully cooperative, for example, and you want to calculate, for example, the invasion probability. If you place in this fully cooperative population a defector, you would like to see under which condition there is a takeover of defectors over the population of cooperators. These sort of things, then you can study how this depends on the rules that you are implementing, or on the network of contact, etc. But there is one important question when you go to study humans is if these rules make sense at all, if people play or, or evolve their strategies following these kind of rules. And this is what uh, we questioned a few years ago. Actually, you can show that uh, the way in which this uh, evolves depends a lot on, on the network, on the topology that you have, for example, and on the initial conditions. For example, let's suppose that you have a linear change, and, and you can easily see that uh, there, there are only two possible states, full cooperation and full defection, 
And there's only one condition, initial condition, that leads you to the state of full cooperation, which is the one in which everybody is a cooperator at the beginning, and two out to the power of n minus, minus one, that leads you to a uh, fully defective system. But then you should change a bit this, and you, for example, do a starlight graph, and then you can show that actually there are uh, more initial conditions that, that leads you to um, <clears throat> A full uh, cooperation, and there is also the state of full defection. For example, you can show that if the central node is a cooperator and you have p peripheral nodes where p is defined by t's, then this is the temptation to defect. Then the system will end up in the fully uh, cooperator uh, regime. So this already shows with very simple topologies that there are a lot of things uh, behind this. Uh, the network structure, the initial condition, etc., etc. Uh, actually, if you do this in more complex uh, topologies, you can show that uh, in general, what you have is that there is a cluster of what we call pure cooperator. This is these are people that all the time cooperate, and these are connected to a set of individuals that from so from time to time change from cooperation to defection. So sometimes cooperate, sometimes defect and the pure defectors that are the individuals that all the time uh, are defectors. For this to be stable, you have to have another pure cooperator here that only interact with this because th these guys represent the stable sort of benefits for this, so they can play as pure cooperator without, uh, let's say, changing the strategy. And then you can do some math here and, and for example, demonstrate that there is a set of initial condition that is invariant for the evolutionary dynamics which means that no trajectory inside F evolves to an equilibrium configuration out of F. So this is more or less what you can do analytically in simple topologies because uh, you are fixed in this and this is somehow arbitrary but um, uh, with some given condition. Actually when you do the simulation, for example a scale free network and represent the final state of the system, you see that this is the actual structure of how cooperation is organized. So you have these pure cooperators here, then these that interact with the fluctuating, and these fluctuations are connected to the factor nodes. So this is more or less the structure of cooperation. Um, and for this, uh, Robert May and, and Martin Novak in, in the early 90s, uh, working in, in lattices, they found actually that uh, cooperation can be, uh, I'm using the prisoner dilemma, that cooperation can be sustained if uh, there is some network structure, because there are these clusters of cooperators that uh, provide benefits for themselves, and they can survive the invasion of the factors. And the scale-free networks then, in the 20, uh, 2005, 2006, there were different works that show that this effect is enhanced when you have more complex structure like scale-free network, etc. So all this is okay if you are analyzing the biological system, of bacteria, for example, because you don't actually know how these bacteria uh, behave. They, the bacteria actually cannot take decisions. Uh, this is just ruled by um, the biology of the system. But then you can question whether this is true at all when you play with human. And I would like to bring to your attention one quote by Richard Feynman that I like very much because it's very for this, it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is, it doesn't matter how smart you are, if it doesn't agree with the experiment, it's wrong. So the question is if these agree with experiments or not, and I will advance that most of the time they do not. So um, let me show you one simple example of uh, human behavior that shows already that we are very uh, prone to be influenced by very small details in our environment. So this is a very simple and nice experiment that was done in the UK University, in the department in the UK University. So you have a kind of coffee room with coffee and tea. You can go prepare your coffee, your tea, and you can put milk. Of course, you are in Britain. You can put milk in the coffee or in the in the tea. And, and if you put milk, you, you have to pay a fixed amount. But you are given the freedom to choice whether you pay or not. So if you put milk and you are going to pay you, let's say you have to pay 20 cents. But if you want, you cannot, you, you don't pay. 
So what they do is to put just in front of the dispensers different photos. Each week they change each photo, so flowers and, and eyes, and then they collected. They just added up how much was collected each week, um, and the results were quite uh, for me awesome because uh, it's, it's something as simple as an image in front of the dispenser changed a lot the amount collected. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's something that is not. Uh, I mean, it's no no one washing actually washing. It's just a photo. Uh, and you see that there are a lot of so if you want to collect more then you can do uh, like this <laughs> uh, and you will we are changing policy for the coffee <laughs> 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 yeah, and there will be no picture there will be a big guy <laughs> so for, for instance that will mean that humans can be fine-tuned as, as we as we usually talk um, so this is a simple example that already tells you that we are very influenced by a lot of us. We can be influenced by a small details like this. So what we did was, okay, let's test this, this theory um, and let's do some experiments. Um, this is back in 2011. So the, the, the most affected uh, for human behavior rules were they imitate the best and then these two this is the replicator uh, equation that we inherit from, from biology. So essentially the frequencies of strategy X change with time according to this equation. Uh, so the most important thing here is that it depends on the difference of payoff between you and, and your opponent or, or, or the people that play one strategy and the people that play another strategy. Uh, but this doesn't allow, when you implement this, it doesn't allow irrational move in the sense that you change your strategy only if this favors your payoff. So if this uh, is larger than zero, this is for so you are assuming full rationality in this case. The Fermi like rule allows you to also adopt some irrational move in the sense that even if it's small, the probability of adopting a, a strategy that in principle could lead you to get less payoff is possible. So this is the, the Fermi life rule that saturates depending on the difference of payoff, etc. Yeah. So yeah, what, what is the depth of G here? Uh, this is uh, so, so the normalization factor. This is something that you have to take into account to, to assure that this is between zero and one, and depends on the topology of the system. Uh, normally, it's the maximum allowed payoff difference between two uh, I any mean two players in the system. So. Um, so the first experiment that was reported for relatively large system was this one that was done by my collaborator uh, Sanchez Ancho in Madrid. And they do an experiment with 169 people. So this sounds like a small number, but this is huge but for, for a behavioral economist. Uh, that is usually uh, is used to do experiments with 10, 20 people in a lab. This is 169. <laughs> So what they do was did was to um, do different experiments, and they put these people to play on a regular lattice, like a grid, uh, and they measure what is the probability of playing or cooperation after um, uh, as a function of the number of cooperators in the neighborhood. And they notice is that um, depending on your last move, the probability of cooperation increases if you play as cooperator before in the last round, and decreases if you play as defector. So if you play as defector, the most likely outcome is that you still keep playing as defector, and if you play cooperation as a cooperator, the most likely is that you keep uh, playing as cooperator, but this depends on the number of, of, uh, of cooperators in the neighborhood. So it doesn't seem to be any relation with the payoff, but it's more uh, depending on the density or if you want the number of cooperators in the neighborhood. But still, this is, let's say, for um, a regular network, um, and then this doesn't answer the question whether the network has some effect. There were a lot of words and, um, and proposals, particularly Martin Novak and others, and myself, when, we, when I started to do theory about this, claiming that um, heterogeneous structures promote cooperation and this kind of thing. So what we did is, the first thing that we did is, okay, if we assume that this is okay, 
let's see what happened in other topologies. And you can do some math. A mean field approximation, you can express the average level of cooperation and then do some math. And then well, what you do, you get to this equation that relates density of cooperations as a function of the density of the factor in your network. And as you see, there is no difference, payoff difference here. And actually, when you do this uh, in different topologies, you see that for scale free, for lattice, or in the mean field version that is all to all, you will expect the same um, behavior for the average level of cooperation as a function of the density of cooperators. So you see here that the network has no effect there. But again, this is still theory, but it, this is something that you take from the experiment, one rule that you found, and see, okay, if I assume that this is true for whatever network I have, what would I, would, would I expect? And you see that you should expect no dependency with the network topology. But again, it still is not an experiment. So the next step was, okay, this is a prediction of the model. Let's compare scale free and lattice and, if, and do the experiment. The problem with doing this experiment with scale free networks is that, as you know, if you want to generate a heterogeneous network, then you have to uh, go to at least 500, 600 people. So to have some heterogeneity in the degree distribution. And we are talking about humans. So how can I do an experiment with 600 people at the same time? Well, we did in Zaragoza in 2012. We took our students, high school students, from, from 42 schools, and they were playing in their computer labs, and we developed a software that allowed them to connect, so you, they, it's blind for them, but uh, behind the software, they are, were connected using two different topologies. 625 were here, playing with a regular lattice, with uh, periodic boundary conditions, so actually it's kind of this. Um, everybody has connectivity for those, that means that you have only four neighbors. And then we generated 609, so this 1,229 individuals were playing at the same time, uh, where the degree goes from 2 to 16, is the, is the, the, the one that has the largest number of neighbors. And so the, the question was, okay, how would be the, uh, how is the cooperation, the average cooperation of these two very different networks? So this is, for example, how you present the, the model. There are a lot of subtleties where you do these experiments. You see, for example, that I cannot tell them that if you cooperate and the other one cooperate and so on and so forth, because that induce some kind of psychological effect and that, that could somehow frame the, the experiment. So what you actually do is, if you choose blue and the other one choose blue, then you get Seven. If you choose blue and the other one this other color, then you get zero. But then if you use color, you have to be careful with blind colors and color blind people. And actually we, we did that. We removed combination of colors uh, that account for 99% of color blindness. And still we found two when we did the experiment. So it's, it was kind of... That were color blind to these. To, yeah, 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 to, to these colors. Um, but then... It, you can change the color and that's it. But uh, there are a lot of, of these things. So it's, it's a lot of fun. So this is what they see. For example, one that has three, 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 connect, three individuals. Uh, so this is the instructions that they have to choose. And then you show them what is the payoff um, um, and in the color, the, the action. So if this is cooperators or whatever. So this is how your, the neighbors enter and this is the, the color of uh, I mean, that represent the structure. And then you go back again to this and you do the experiment for a number of rounds. Of course, they don't know neither the number of the total number of rounds. You tell them you will be playing um, from 25 to 35 rounds because it's documented that if you know the number of rounds at the very end, you start to defect because that will give you more uh, profit. This is a video of the experiment. These are the 42 schools, uh, and they were connected. So one of these slides indicated one of these guys is connected to one of these. Um, the red is for uh, cooperation, the, the green is for defection. Um, so this is, uh, I said, 42 schools in the whole uh, community of Aragon. Zaragoza is, is this one, but this is uh, Huesca, and this is Teruel, so it's different parts. Why is a kind of 
lightning halo around the, the school from 10 to 9? Um, yeah. uh, this is just because you focus there, but uh, the, the, because actually there was a graph here showing the level of preparation. Oh. Uh, I'll, I'll remove that. So this is the, the experiment and the results. This is the average level of cooperation when you do the experiments in the lattice and heterogeneous and the control. The control consists that you reshuffle the network at every time step. Every round, all the, the you keep the degree sequence, but everyone mm -hmm. changes the neighbor. So they, they play with different people all the time. And you see that both in the control and the experiment, the network has no effect. The, is it, it, it's the same level of cooperation that you get on lattice and heterogeneous. So this tells you that actually all the theory that I myself included uh, were doing, it's useless when you go to study human behavior. Because there are a lot of things that enter into play that you are not taking into account in, in, when you do the theory. Actually, kind of microscopically, it's also very close what you see, the cooperative rounds and the number of players that uh, we're playing for, uh, we're cooperating for a number, a given number of rounds, you see that our rate is the same. And then there is a question. Yeah. Um, so I have a question about how the experiment works if you're playing with 16 other people. Uh, with 16? So, yeah, yeah, with 16 other people. Yeah. So do you play 16 individual games with each of those 16 people, or do you pick one color and then those others all pick? I'm not sure if I understood your question. No, essentially the, the, the yeah. network is static. If that's what you are asking, the network is static. So once you have these, these neighbors, the neighbors change, but your degree is the same. In the control setting, the network could be, I mean, this could be me, this could be Alex, and then in the next round, this could be you and, and Kate, for example. All, this is always two by two, right? Always yeah, two. it's always two, two by two. two. So it's a repeated game. The payoff market doesn't change, so it's... it's so you're playing, you're playing with your degree number of people simultaneously? Yeah, yeah. Everybody is, is playing at the same time. So if and everybody is taking the decision at the same time. But you use uh, one color, so you decide one color <coughs> for all the games? Uh, no, 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 no. no. The color was assigned randomly. No, 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 but each time. Let's imagine I have three neighbors. Yeah. I play independently the same with action. each neighbor, or I choose my color, and that is the one that I play with no, all the three No, neighbors. no, you play, you choose your color, and this color is for, for the all your neighbors. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I didn't understand the action. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's uh, you are not, it's, it's not fair way, it's in the sense that you play first with this, then with this, and then with this. Once you take this, this applies to all the interactions that you have. So, uh, and the reason why you see this, and it, it doesn't uh, match with theory, is that actually when you uh, plot here the frequency of people that cooperate or defect as a function of the difference of the payoff, you don't see any difference. That means that people don't take into account the payoff difference when they take uh, the decisions about how to play. They actually, what they do is what, what it was found in, in the experiments in Madrid, the previous experiment. There is this moody condition of cooperation that essentially means that you take your decision based on your last action and the density of cooperators in the neighborhood. But you don't take into account the payoff difference. Yeah. Sorry, do 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 the 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 pay, pay others observe your payoff or your action or, or it's like a private uh, game. Like you, you you observe others Actions. Yes, yeah, well, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, this is here. This is the information that I actually give to the players. Okay. So if this is you, you are in the center, and then you see the action that is <coughs> modified by the color. So here is the color. So this guy played this action, mm -hmm. um, and this is the payoff, the accumulated payoff of, of that, 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 that guy earned in, the, in this round. So based on that information, so essentially you have what they play, which is in turn back to, to be uh, to be clear is if they cooperated or not. Mm -hmm. You don't call that cooperation or defection, but you know which of the two is cooperator and which of the two is defector. So you know if cooperated or not, and then you also have the information about the total payoff of that individual in the last round. Okay. And based on that, you take your decision. It turns out that people doesn't take into account the payoff. They take into account how many cooperators there are in the neighborhood. 
So this is the matter of conclusion. So um, of course, this is just one experiment with a fixed payoff matrix, and then you have a lot of questions. So you say, okay, what happens if we change the payoff matrix? Well, okay, that has not been answered yet because um, it's, it's, these experiments are a very nightmare, logistically speaking. And then it's, this, for example, was kind of uh, 15,000 euros just to pay participants because you have to pay participants, otherwise, it's meaningless real money, you have to pay them. Then there are questions like uh, if there are any cross cultural effects, uh, if this change occur, uh, across the individual lifetime, because we, we did that with um, high school students, normally results are reported for um, one second year, first second year um, university students, because they are the ones that are available. And then also the question whether this this is because the network is static or not. So I will briefly go through uh, to answer some of these questions. Cross-cultural effects. Well, it could be there could be cross-cultural effects. Actually, there is one game which this is well documented. This is the ultimatum game. In the ultimatum game, you have something to divide. For example, one euro or one dollar, and then I propose you to split this dollar in a given way. For example, twenty cent for you and eighty cent for me. If you accept, we make the deal. If you don't accept, no one gets anything. Um, theoretically speaking, the Nash uh, solution to this is that I should offer you the less I can, one cent, and you should accept that, that because one cent is more than nothing. And you, if you are fully rational, you should accept that. But of course, we are human. So you say, OK, you are taking 99 cents and me one cent. No, I don't want that deal. And so uh, here are results that have been done using with this experiment uh, in many places uh, around the world. And for example, if you look at the mean offer, that means the, the mean acceptance rate or uh, split, uh, you see that it's gone from 26, 26 to, for example, 0.58, uh, 36. So there is a lot of variation depending on where you are. There are some of these things that can be explained. For example, this one, uh, this is because this is small um, culture um, in, in Indonesia. Uh, for them, it's, um, it's, it's, it's not, uh, I mean, it's, uh, the culture says that you should accept whatever you are proposed, or not, the other way around. You should give more than what you take you, for yourself. So you should be generous. And there are other places there that it's the contrary. You should accept whatever you are offered because that's uh, it's kind of respectful for your uh, host. So obviously there are cross-cultural effects. I have to say that we haven't seen such a, a huge effect in the experiment that we have done. We have done experiments in Madrid, in Zaragoza, and in Barcelona. Um, um, maybe between Zaragoza and Madrid there are not too many differences, but uh, when, when Catalan enter into play, then uh, <laughs> you know there. Are, there could be some differences. So this should be addressed more, more, more carefully. The the other was uh, across an individual lifetime. So one thing that we do was okay. Uh, let's see if if we can do some experiments with people of different age and see if the results change when you, because common sense will tell you okay. We maybe when you are when you are in the adulthood, um, when you are young, you are kind of okay. Uh, you have your ideas and you want to change the world and then you enter into the real world and then you say okay i have to watch out for my stuff so these kind of things right uh and so we did an experiment in the fair in barcelona we went to barcelona and, and we recruited randomly people there and this is how we divided the, the people so there is a cultural experiment in which you put to play people for different age and then we, we did these uh, seven groups, um, kids from 10 to 16 years old. Um, Most of them were average 12 years old. So from 70 to 25, 26, 35, and so on, so for over 66 years. So there was this, this kind of things. Um, and we have, um, we did the experiments using a prisoner dilemma with four people. So everybody was playing with everybody in a group of four. And we played this for 25 rounds. 
Uh, again, the setup is, is the same. You don't tell them uh, what they are doing. Um, this is uh, the sort of things that they see. Uh, then we did a set of experiments using more kids because we found very distinct behavior and we wanted to be sure that well, that was okay. So we, we went to another school and did uh, uh, further rounds of experiments using years, uh, kids from 11 and 12 years old. And these are the results. Um, so this is the fraction of cooperative actions as a function of the group age. You see that there are two different behaviors clearly here. The first one are the Gandhis. They are more cooperative than anyone else. Then there is uh, this, this is the control group, what you expect in the control group, that in which age plays no role because people of different age are playing. And then you see that roughly speaking, um, or within the statistical uh, error, there is no variation in the average level of cooperation with respect to the age, except when you get to the kids. But the kids, again, uh, are less cooperative than the, uh, the, the other ones. So that was kind of curious because you have these two extreme. Kids are not very cooperative and, and the elders are very cooperative. And you see, okay, that's, that makes sense. I mean, my, my kids, uh, you know, uh, they want to keep their toys for them. They don't want to share anything. <laughs> This kind of things. So we, we did an uh, analysis of data, um, and the reason why the kids behave that way is because they actually don't follow this moody condition of cooperation. This is the control group, but it's, it applies to all the rest of the group. This is the probability of cooperation after cooperation or after defection. And you see that there are clearly two trends here. When you defect, the probability of cooperation decreases when the number of cooperators in the neighborhood increases. And this increases a little bit when uh, after you uh, you cooperate. But kids, they don't distinguish between previous action of cooperation or defection. It's true that it's conditional to the environment in the sense that the more cooperators they have in the neighborhood, the more likely it is that they cooperate. But that's independent of the previous action. So they don't have memory. They are Macomian. <laughs> <laughs> they have no memory at all. They can. They play according to what they see in the in the environment. And actually, the, this I think is. They agree with me. <laughs> you sure. agree with that? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> so this is actually what, what uh, reflected better here. This is just the probability of cooperation as a function of the age um, after cooperation or after infection. See that there is this sum here that after cooperation, all age except the kids. Uh, clearly distinguish after cooperation and after defection. The kids are moving here, so they don't distinguish between cooperation and defection. What is the empty symbols there? Oh, these are the, 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 the two experiments with the kids. Oh. So this is the, the fair, and this is for, for in, the, in the school. So this just was to test that uh, there is no side effects of being missing. Um, actually, yeah, this was something that um, it's one of the few cases in which uh, uh, sociologists, or I don't know who was the guy, but he was not a physicist. And he provided very <laughs> 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 He provided, no, because I have a lot of experience with that. Uh, we will come to that. But he provided very, very detailed reviews and, and advice, and, and his key suggestion was you should replicate the student uh, the result with the kids because just to be sure that this is robust and doesn't depend on, on, on they were, you know, with your with the parents, the fair, and these kind of things. You mean, just as a warning, there are a lot of social scientists. <laughs> <laughs> Before you yeah, go down no, no, and start no, 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 I don't know the story. stories no, actually, that you, you tell. <laughs> no, it's, it's not with social scientists. It was, it was more economic, uh, someone from economy. No, but very. No, that's why I use a lot of this uh, phrase by my friend. Because, uh, I mean, one of the papers that I will comment just right after this, uh, it's, it was we submitted to a journal, and um, at some point, the reviewer that we believe is a theoretical economist told us that, um, well, your results doesn't match the theory, you should revise your data. <laughs> <laughs> and the worst was that the editor back up that 
review. So it was kind of, yeah. So let's, uh, so this is what, what we found for the kids. I will go very fast to uh, this one, but it's uh, uh, addressing this question whether this has to do with uh, the static nature of the graph. Um, there were a couple of, of experiments in which uh, they either did the experiment with no memory or with very long memory. Memory in, uh, refers to the fact that you remember what you did in previous rounds. So what we did was uh, experiments in Madrid in which uh, we get people to play um, and they were able to remember what they did in the last n rounds. Actually we showed that. So you, when you do this, um, you, you show the, what, what they took. And, they, and they, they, let's say the, the trick part here was that you were they were able to dish, uh, connect from people that they don't like to play anymore and uh, through a link to a new one, whatever they want, at no cost. Uh, but of course, if you can disconnect, because that's your decision, but if uh, you want to connect to someone else, you have to be accepted. So it's reciprocal. So it's not that you connect and, and that's it. So, um, and, and the question here is, well, again, the level of cooperation, but uh, reputation, because this is another of the mechanisms that have been proposed as a promoter of cooperation. If you have a high reputation as a cooperator, then it's probably that uh, people want to uh, attach to you. Um, uh, but after all, uh, when you talk about cooperation, reputation, how do you define reputation? You, you see this in Amazon reviews, so how? How do you actually value comments from someone? How you define how reputated is an individual? When is given a, provided a review or whatever. So we did again the experiment uh, showing this, uh, and here you have to show who are the neighbors, and also depending on the memory, you have to show then, um, no, the, the next one, you have to show then if you have to propose new uh, links, and if you want to break down links that already exist, and then if you are, if someone want to attach you, you are given the, also the, uh, the possibility to accept or reject that. Uh, and notice that here is the action of the player. So you are giving information about what this guy did in previous round. In this case, it's n is equal to 1. It's only one, the, the last round. You are providing only information about the last round. So the first things that you do, so we play this memory 0, 1, 3, and 5. 5 means that here you have 5. Uh, the, the last five actions. Um, and then you can, for example, uh, again, fraction of cooperative actions. You see that for memory zero, this is very low. For memory one, three, and five, it's more or less the same. And this is what you expect from a rational player. The rational player is you see the average fraction of link. What, what it should do, what the player should do, is to launch as many um, links as possible. Uh, you, you, you can uh, establish at most five each round, so you, can, you, you should uh, launch as many um, links as possible. You don't know, you don't have information, this is memory zero, so you don't know what the other actually play, but you know that if you are playing as a defector, the way in which you can maximize your payoff is to have as many players as possible, because that increases the probability of playing with a cooperator and therefore ending more money. So um, this is a snapshot of how the network evolves, uh, and you see that depending on the memory, it changes a little bit. Uh, here, it's, it's what I just mentioned. Uh, it's very dense because everybody is, is linking to everybody else. And here, you see uh, that the network is not that dense, and there are some links. The width is proportional to the time that this link uh, was uh, lived. Um, uh, and so, uh, and, and the colors represent the average fraction of cooperative action. So you see that um, the, the network is not um, as trivial as this one. Uh, actually, when you compute, for example, the fraction of proposals and the fraction of broken links, you see that in this case is um, proportional to the cooperative reputation that I will go to define. But essentially, is out of the last n rounds, how many? you play as cooperator. So if there is a memory five and you play three, 
uh, as a cooperator, your reputation as a cooperator is three over five. In principle, is that good? Uh, actually, when we do then do uh, the fitting, it's, it's not that way, but uh, it's, it's more or less roughly that way. So this is uh, the number of fraction of proposals. You see that increases when the cooperative reputation increases, and then the fraction of broken link. Nobody wants to break a link with someone that has high reputation, but breaks a lot of links with someone that has very low reputation. Yeah. And how to define reputation? Well, it turns out that reputation can be defined taking into account the last action and an average of the rest of the actions. So you see, for example, here that you can appreciate it more. You see that here there are um, a group of a uh, fraction of a second proposal. There is a group here that is uh, roughly have a, a lot of things in common. Um, the, the lot of things that have in common is that they have three cooperative actions and two defections. So they have two defections and three cooperative actions. But you see that uh, depending on, on the average and also on the last action, there are small differences. So for example, uh, here you see cooperator, cooperator, cooperator. All these have last action cooperator, and then you have two more cooperations here, but all of these are cooperators. So this is a group, and this is a group in which you have the factors, with again two cooperations, like here and here, but this here is distinguishable from this. So this means that um, what actually defines the reputation of individual is what you did in the last round and the average of the rest of the round. And, and you can actually represent that. People are, are, are smart because they are not cooperating all the time. As they define cooperation in that way, they try to keep high level of reputation in the sense that they cooperate frequently but not all the time. From time to time, they defect is kind of, okay, I defect just to collect uh, a few of, of the payoff and, and get uh, the other cooperators, but then I immediately go back to cooperation because otherwise my reputation will decrease. And then people normally, for example, here, um, they, they, the peak is around two for memory three, so that means that on average, two of the three last rounds you play as cooperator and then switch to one cooperation. And also for n equal to five, three and four are the more. Uh, so in principle, this allows you to define these cooperations and so on. So the final thing that we we wanted to test also, because up to now we have been playing prisoner dilemma, and then we wanted to see if there is anything else when you don't play on the prisoner dilemma. Um, we again went to Barcelona and we devised this um, app. Um, <coughs> this is in Spanish, but essentially this is telling you, this is what you see. Um, when you start a uh, game, um, this is at, at variance with the is one shot game. So you only play one time with an uh, individual, and then you change your neighbor and play one time. And what we did is to play uh, with different payoff matrices so that you go through this space of games. So this is the armory game, snow drift, stack down, in the prisoner dilemma. So what we, what, uh, we did was that uh, at each round, randomly, you select uh, a pair of these uh, S and T, and these are the entry matrices here, um, and then uh, this, this random pair of, of S and T will place you in different games. Here, for example, the rational solution is to cooperate, here is to defect, and there is there are mixed equilibria here in these two. Actually, this is, the theoretical solution, this is what you should expect from a rational player, full cooperation here uh, when you are in the upper triangle cooperation and here the faction, here the other way around and here uh, the faction. And this is actually what we saw in the experiments. I, I will just uh, uh, see this one. The most important thing is that you record all the action of the players and then you have a timeline with all the action of the player. And then one thing that you can question is, well, um, can I classify the individuals according to the, the answer or how they play? Um, and this is what we did. So um, uh, what we, 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 take, we took this um, time um, line of the action of the players and we applied a k-means algorithm 
to classify the individual, and it turned out that the, the more uh, of the optimal classification will be in four groups, but actually five, but there is a small group that is, is not uh, excluded, so let's say it's, it's, it's someone that you, you cannot um, uh, describe in, 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 let's say, the, how they play, they kind of play randomly. It's the smallest one is, is like 12%, uh, only 66 players out of, I don't remember, but 540-something, uh, I think. So um, this, is, um, this is what we got from, from this uh, album, um, and we classified this group. is one group that uh, mostly cooperate when they play the harmony, but then the fact, most of the time, whatever the other game is, this is the, what we call pessimism. You will understand that right now. This is um, cooperation here and cooperation here and the fact here. The optimist is the, the contrary to this. So they defect here and cooperate here. And the truthful is someone that most of the time cooperate whatever the game is. So um, this is the paper I was mentioning with the review. Uh, so this is envious. Uh, um, let me just pass here. Yeah. So this is envious because uh, envious is someone that when you look at the strategy, is someone that he wants to beat the opponent. Uh, so the <coughs> rational solution actually is to maximize your payoff. You, you, you would like to maximize payoff. If that means that you are tied with the other one and you, you are completely on equal foot, that's okay as, as, as long as you maximize your payoff. But this guy that we call envious is someone that wants to defeat you even at the cost of paying some uh, part of the benefit. So he doesn't want, or this guy doesn't want to maximize the payoff, provided that they beat you. <coughs> the pessimist is the one that maximizes losses. So this is one that put himself in the worst scenario and according to that uh, play, so it's kind of maximize the, the, the minimum payoff or the losses. The optimist is, is the other way around. So try to maximize, uh, uh, he puts in the best situation, so he expects the best of you, and, and according to that, he, he takes the actions. The truthful is someone that all the time cooperates, um, and this cool is, is it cannot be classified. Actually, um, they normally play nonsense in whatever game you are playing. So these are the, the chat of, of each of these classes. The envious is around 30%, so one third of the population is, is this. Um, this pessimist is the other, but it's more quite close to the optimist, is around 20, 20 something. This is the, the truthful, that is 16, no, 17, 18, and then the truth. The, the so this is the, the one. And just to finish, we just did a couple of experiments that we are right now preparing or drafting. We just finished the analysis. What has to do with uh, climate uh, change issues? So this is our different ways. You, you play a poorly good game. In a poorly good game, um, you are given some money um, and you have to put uh, some money each round. And at the end, you have to reach a target. If, uh, if the group reach the target, then everybody can um, keep the money that, that, that was safe. Um, and if not, then you, you have a high probability of losing everything. So um, this is a, a pretty good game. And this is what we apply here. Um, but with a different respect to classical uh, experiments, um, in this case, we gave to different players different amount of money. So it's kind of heterogeneous. This is to model um, unequal distribution of wealth, let's say, in the society or whatever. So this the game was done in Barcelona, uh, 420 individuals. Um, and they, they were randomly assigned an initial amount and they have to reach a target. Um, so you, you, this is kind of the instructions. So you, you can contribute 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4 is found. Um, you know that there are 10 rounds, and you know what is the target. In this case, it's 120 euros, and the group was um, six individuals. So if everybody put 
two euros per round, that is the fair amount, you will reach the, the, the target. And two euros per round, if you have 40, that means that you can save 20. If you have 20, then you cannot save nothing. But if you have 60, then you can save 40. And it's supposed that those that have more should help the other to, let's say, to save something. Um, and that was the, the question. So the first thing is that in all cases, we reach the target. And actually, this is the contribution per round. And you see that as soon as they see that they can, they will reach the target, they start to put less and less, so they can save more. But the key uh, finding of this experiment was that the rich have to contribute a smaller proportion of their wealth to the collective action. So here is what you expect uh, if, if there is a fair distribution uh, for those that have uh, 20, and they actually put almost twice as, as what they should put. And these are the riches. The riches is here, they should put to be equally uh, comparable with this one, with respect to the capital, they should put like this, and they actually put like that, sometimes less, mm -hmm. depending on the number of, of pounds. Uh, and this happens uh, for all. This is 20, this is 30, and this is 40. And all these are above the perspective that the national line that marks the, the, the fair uh, amount that one has to compute. So this was part of, part of a nice finding. Um, we are trying to connect this with uh, some of the results, but uh, I think this is the key measures that what we found is when you have this unequal distribution of wealth at the beginning, you reach uh, most of the time the target, but this is at the cost of those that have less, not of those that have more. And finally, this one is just to address um, cooperation and altruism that is not the same. It's not the same to be cooperative than to be altruist, altruistic. Um, for that, we designed an experiment. Again, it's a public good. And then you, you can um, imagine that these are kind of uh, boxes which you can put uh, your money. You are given 100 monetary units. It's time step. Um, and then we, we tested two different setups. In one, you, you can put whatever you want. So if you want to put nothing, you put nothing. And in the other one, you have to distribute all the money. So in the setup that you have to distribute all the money, cooperation is what you have put here. So, I'm uh, no, sorry, what you have put here. This is 20%. Um, that means that whatever you put here, 20% of that is donated to a non-governmental organization. But in this case, you are forced to distribute everything. So you decide how much you put here, if you want to put zero or not. And this defines your level of cooperation. In the altruism setup, to measure set altruism, you relax that condition and you say, OK, you are giving 100 um, of this. And then you are free to put whatever amount you want in whatever box you want. And then the altruism is the amount that you put in whatever of these boxes. Not in this one because this is zero. So that means that you always put, if you, even if you are not forced, you are giving something. Um, these are the results. So there are a lot of results, but the first, the, the one that I want to highlight here is the one that uh, um, tells that women are much better than men in the sense that women, as you see here, this is uh, the factors, neutral and cooperators. You see here that women are more cooperators and altruistic than men. Men are more cooperators. Uh, more, you have a lot of the factors here, selfish or cooperator, but not altruistic. So women are almost 70, 60% are both cooperators and altruistic, while um, men are roughly 30%. So it's, it's, it's a lot. Uh, Huge difference. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, this one that we just published. Uh, uh, all these um, things that we have been doing, people are not. Um, you don't see. I mean, you don't. Um, the student, for example, we did, we did that in the schools. They were playing with kids of different schools, so they, there is completely anonymous. There is no kind of. Uh, friendships or whatever. So one thing that we did was to test whether anonymity uh, is, is also a promoter of cooperation. 
And for this, we did the experiment in China, where we, uh, my Chinese collaborators, did the experiments there. And then these are the results. Uh, we have two treatments. Uh, treatment one is anonymous, so you don't know which whom you are playing. And the second one, you are playing with someone that you uh, know to some extent. So it's classmates or, or someone or something like that. Um, and then you see, for example, that uh, there is a, low, a, a, a large influence of this anonymity in the sense that uh, punishment it, it don't, uh, most of the time takes place when they don't know each other. Very, uh, the most, the largest difference are between cooperation and the faction. You see that if you know each other, cooperation is, uh, is, is very likely, while the faction is not when you are also, um, when you uh, know each other. So one thing that we plan to do in this regard is to try to um, tune, let's say, the level of uh, anonymity or anonymity to see if there is one change uh, at some point. So that's my final message. Um, when we started this, um, we, we, we realized that we have to go back to the original physics in the sense that we have to do experiments, uh, observe the world, and, and, and then um, hopefully we will be able to understand a few things from that. And that would also be <coughs> feedback from physics because you will be able to do models that supposedly that are non equilibrium models and all this stuff. So these are my main collaborators and the, the, the grants that support this because this is not very cheap to do. Thank you very much. Again, I don't think that you gain in popularity in social science and economics if you write physics and new physics, etc. Et <laughs> that's just as a, as a two cents. So, you know, it's, uh, Everything is physics, yeah, but you know. That's no, but this is actually I'm criticizing physicists, not so. Yeah, yeah, I know that you're criticizing the physicists, but yeah. So there, just time for a couple of quick questions because we was uh, we are already over time. So there is any burning things? Otherwise, just let me tell you that Yemir will stay for two weeks. Uh, so we'll travel with basically all of us to <laughs> to net side, and then we will come back. So you know, it's uh, but. Uh, uh, he will be around, and so you are please, uh, you're welcome to find him uh, in the uh, on the tenth floor and ask him question. There is any burning question at the moment? Been a lot, so thank you very much. Thank you.